The contrast between primitive art and naturalistic or illusionist art can easily be overdrawn. All art is image-making, and all image-making is rooted in the creation of substitutes. Even the artist of an illusionist persuasion must make the man-made, the conceptual image of convention, his starting point. Strange as it may seem, he cannot simply imitate an object's external form without having first learned how to construct such a form. If it were otherwise, there would be no need for the innumerable books on how to draw the human figure, or how to draw ships. Wolflin once remarked that all pictures owe more to other pictures than they do to nature. It is a point which is familiar to the student of pictorial traditions, but which is still insufficiently understood in its psychological implications. Perhaps the reason is that, contrary to the hopeful belief of many artists, the innocent eye, which should see the world afresh, would not see it at all. It would smart under the painful impact of a chaotic medley of forms and colors. In this sense, the conventional vocabulary of basic forms is still indispensable to the artist as a starting point, as a focus of organization. How, then, should we interpret the great divide which runs through the history of art and sets off the few islands of illusionist styles, of Greece, of China, and of the Renaissance, from the vast ocean of conceptual art. One difference undoubtedly lies in a change of function. In a way, the change is implicit in the emergence of the idea of the image as a representation in our modern sense of the word. As soon as it is generally understood that an image need not exist in its own right, that it may refer to something outside itself and therefore be the record of a visual experience, Rather than the creation of a substitute, the basic rules of primitive art can be transgressed with impunity. No longer is there any need for that completeness of essentials which belongs to the conceptual style. No longer is there the fear of the casual which dominates the archaic conception of art. The picture of a man on a Greek vase no longer needs a hand or a foot in full view. We know it is meant as a shadow a mere record of what the artist saw or might see, and we are quite ready to join in the game and to supplement with our own imagination what the real motif undoubtedly possessed. Once this idea of the picture suggesting something beyond what is really there is accepted in all its implications, and this certainly did not happen overnight, we are indeed forced to let our imagination play around it. We endow it with space around its forms, which is only another way of saying that we understand the reality which it evokes as three-dimensional, that the man could move, and that even the aspect momentarily hidden was there. When medieval art broke away from that narrative conceptual symbolism into which the formulas of classical art had been frozen, Giotto made particular use of the figure seen from behind, which stimulates our spatial imagination by forcing us to imagine the other side. Thus the idea of the picture as a representation of a reality outside itself leads to an interesting paradox. On the one hand, it compels us to refer every figure and every object shown to that imaginary reality which is meant. This mental operation can only be completed if the picture allows us to infer not only the external form of every object represented, but also its relative size and position. It leads us to that rationalization of space we call scientific perspective, by which the picture plane becomes a window through which we look into the imaginary world the artist creates there for us. In theory, at least, painting is then conceived in terms of geometrical projection. The paradox of the situation is that, once the whole picture is regarded as the representation of a slice of reality, a new context is created, in which the conceptual image plays a different part. For the first consequence of the window idea is that we cannot conceive of any spot on the panel which is not significant, which does not represent something. The empty patch thus easily comes to signify light, air, and atmosphere, and the vague form is interpreted as enveloped by air. It is this confidence in the representational context which is given by the very convention of the frame, which makes the development of Impressionist methods possible. The artists who tried to rid themselves of their conceptual knowledge, who conscientiously became beholders of their own work and never ceased matching their created images against their impressions by stepping back and comparing the two, 
these artists could only achieve their aim by shifting something of the load of creation onto the beholder. For what else does it mean if we are enjoyed to step back in turn and watch the colored patches of an Impressionist landscape spring to life? It means that the painter relies on our readiness to take hints, to read the contexts, and to call up our conceptual image under his guidance. The blob in the painting by Manet, which stands for a horse, is no more an imitation of its external form than is our hobby horse. But he has so cleverly contrived it that it evokes the image in us, provided, of course, we collaborate. Here, there may be another field for independent investigation, for those privileged objects which play their part in the earliest layers of image-making recur, as was to be expected, in that of image-reading. The more vital the feature that is indicated by the context and yet omitted, the more intense seems to be the process that is started off. On its lowest level, this method of suggestive veiling is familiar to erotic art, not of course to its Pygmalion phase, but to its illusionist applications. What is here a crude exploitation of an obvious biological stimulus may have its parallel, for instance, in the representation of the human face. Leonardo achieved his greatest triumphs of lifelike expression by blurring precisely the features in which the expression resides, thus compelling us to complete the act of creation. Rembrandt could dare to leave the eyes of his most moving portraits in the shade because we are thus stimulated to supplement them. The evocative image, like its conceptual counterpart, should be studied against a wider psychological background. Gombrich finishes this essay by returning once more to the hobby horse, but I think we all get the idea. I hope this lecture was interesting. Please remember to like and subscribe.